left here seven. Six left at Freiburg. No sure the kill. He's going to pick it up. If just exists the match, he's going with the run. There's no time. Oh, he's got Freiburg. Are you kidding me? Because of the kill. Hello everyone and welcome to By The Numbers. Uh, I'm Richard Lewis. With me, my co-host is, of course, Duncan Thorin Shields. We were sat here watching that and, and Duncan's going, feels wrong how good that intro is. It is a bit slick, isn't it, Duncan? I it is. It's like, it's like the production level has finally reached a point where somehow a show that we're on actually has like, like cool music and flashy shots and event stuff tied into it. I don't know what it is. But... We're done. We're fucked. It's over. Um... How was how was Amsterdam? Yeah, it was good. It was it was actually sort of a lot like the last episode. Like I felt like I was just I would lose track of things every now and then. I would try and get them back on. You know, it'd be like a rubber band effect. And then suddenly, like I was in a different place in time, and like there seemed to be a dilation of time occurring, <laughs> just because of the weather. You know, it was uh, it was oh, cold, and then yeah. sometimes it was warm. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. All about the weather. All about the weather. Yeah, yeah. But it's good. It's good to have you back. It's good to see what you back. Fresh in, air uh, while I was there. Filled my Definitely. lungs with it, and uh, just had a nice walk around. Really, you know. And and of course, Alpha Draft doesn't endorse the use of fresh air in any way, shape, or form. Oh. Um, good to see you back wearing a big coat, though, mate. In in your uh, <coughs> cold cold apartment, uh, that that's what we like to see. Maybe now with this show, we'll be able to change that. We'll be able to get the heating turned on for you. I hope so. So Maybe. we're going to talk about some Counter Strike. The last show, the feedback we got is well. You did talk a lot about that <laughs> fantasy draft stuff. You didn't talk so much about the news that was going on. So I think we're going to start right at the top of the show by talking about some of the news that's been going on. Uh, big story, Duncan. I'm sure it didn't escape your attention. Uh, yeah. Was the news that the Indian player, Krish, had been vac banned and his team neck break, say, wrongfully. Now, the, the world was rocked by this cheating allegation. Uh, but what makes the story actually interesting is, I don't know if you saw this, they kind of went a bit CSI on it, Team Net Break. I've like never seen anything like this in my life, by the way. They went and got CCTV footage from the Internet Cafe <laughs> where he was allegedly playing at last. When And they show on the footage that some guy goes over to his PC while he leaves it unattended and unlocked and maybe does something to it, maybe has a little you know tweak around with it, could have possibly installed a hack. And they are saying that this is the evidence that they want to use to get Valve to have an investigation and get him on VAC banned. Now, it's a ridiculous story. I, I've, I've got to pick your brains on it. I mean, first and foremost, when I saw the story, I was like, wow, must be a slow news day at HLTV. Because I've never even heard of these players. <laughs> yeah, so that's not even news that he gets VAC banned. But OK, the story goes up. The part I don't get right is... Like, listen, I don't really care enough to actually investigate as to whether or not someone actually did do something in the CCTV. But how naive is this imagination that they have that Valve are going to bother researching that and see if one individual vac band should be overturned on the basis of this video footage? Like, I think they're just naive in terms of what they think Valve are like. Dude, we can we can literally show Valve in, like, the finals of majors where, like, a pistol's overpowered. And then they're just like, yeah, I'm not really interested, to be honest, mate. Could you go away? So, like, I don't think Valve's going to look at this video and do anything. Like, I think there's no chance it gets overturned, put it that way. Well, yeah, I, I don't think so either. I, I do love the idea that like some Indian manager of, of, of Neckbreak was sat there like, enhance, enhance, like with full fucking CSI on it, like zooming in and shit, just to try and find out who this guy is that may have planted a cheat on it. There's even an uh, implication here that the guy did it on purpose because he knew he was a pro player and he was actually targeting him either to hack the account or just to solely get him back banned. But it does bring up a serious question here. And this is something that I thought actually was worth talking about a lot more than it actually got talked about at the time of the vacuuming. And that was, does Valve need like a commissioner? Dare I say it, does Valve need a Nick Allen type to look at you know professional players who are going to go to international tournaments, look at VAT bans, look at cheating allegations, and maybe come out and give sort of definitive statements on the matter? 
Yeah, I think so. Especially if it's going to have like, if esports is going to be a major part of it. Like before, I could always give them as a, a, a mild pass in as much as esports didn't used to make them most of the money. And on top of that, no one knew how long the CSGO esports would last. Like we didn't even know when the first majors happened. Like would these continue? Will there just be like one every year? Well, but now it seems to be regular. So now when, if you actually, if you've accepted that it's going to be a big part of your business, it makes sense yeah. to have someone, especially because as we know from going to tournaments, it doesn't matter how many rules you put out there. You can never design a perfect rule book where you could have like a computer decide every single case. You're still going to need someone ultimately who makes like judgment calls. And so ideally there'd be some guy who like a commissioner type guy who'd be that guy, you know, and hopefully he'd be a community person who like, we'd at least understand his rationale for why he picked something. I think it would just help overall. And then we'd at least have like, I mean, it'll sound like a joke when I say it about Nick Allen, because obviously people then just use him as like the lightning rod for everything <laughs> bad in the scene. But I mean, yeah. in a positive way, it'd be nice if we had one guy where like we could literally say to that guy, like, you have to take action or what, you, what do you think about this? Whereas at the moment, just saying like Valve, do something like that doesn't really go anywhere. You know, you've already thrown that message in, in a bottle in the sea, you know? Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I, I nominate you for League Commissioner, actually. I think I think that's, you know, it would be nice to have you as a Valve employee. You know, just there operating as the league commissioner. I am the law. I think this could work, actually, Duncan. Thing is, I, that's that's the sort of position I would actually be ideally suited for. Because <laughs> the thing is, I w that's the whole point. I would have my reasons for doing something, and then if people didn't like it, I'd be like, "Well, it's my decision." So this is an end of discussion. And then yeah, players would have to come to me. Uh, listen, I wouldn't abuse my position at all, Rich. But players would have to come before me and like pledge fealty and start to explain their case, and I'd be like, yeah. "Okay, get right." I'm going to allow this, this time. But then when someone like, I don't know, maybe a Navi player came, I'd be like, I'm going to choose not to cle grant clemency in this particular case. Uh, you will be fined the maximum amount and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it could be an ideal opportunity finally that, you know, you'd be able to get shocks to kiss the ring, which I know you've wanted for some time. Oh, yeah, CSGO still, yeah. CSGO still, yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, I think we can safely say this Indian chap isn't going to have any impact, well, pr pretty much on Counter-Strike, uh, but definitely not on fantasy drafting. Uh, so so we'll, we'll move on to the next, uh, the next story that I wanted to talk about. Now, this is equally irrelevant, but I think it's probably worth mentioning. Right, right there, level with Indian Counter-Strike in terms of competitiveness is UK Counter-Strike, of course. Um, so it's a nice little segue. Uh, and they had the ESL UK Premiership. I was uh, meant to be uh, involved in that event in some capacity, but for some reason, Duncan, I, I wasn't able to attend. Um, the team Zenex uh, managed to win uh, this weekend with a 2-0 victory over Infused. Uh, it was a 26-23 Barnstormer on cash and then a fairly comprehensive 16-4 stomp on Mirage. Uh, and, of course, that is the team with uh, Rattlesnake in it. It's his team that he's assembled. Uh, I don't know how uh, closely you've been following UK uh, Counter-Strike of late. Certainly it's in the toilet. But uh, Zenex seem to be a team that could, if any team's going to, you know, potentially compete with some of the big boys. Well, when I say big boys, all right, I'm, I'm really overselling it there. Compete with some of the smaller big boys, the the medium boys. Uh, do you think this is a good platform now to maybe say, you know, perhaps a few more events like this and then UKCS could be clawing its way back? Well, when you just look how much prize money there was, £2,500 for first place in this tournament, is that's pretty good money. I mean, that's the sort of money you get for prize money in some tournaments for finishing third to fourth in like big international tournaments where you'd have to play Fnatic or Envious or someone. So that th at this point, I think there is the money there where as these other leagues, we've seen all these leagues at the moment, you've already started to see the kind of the oversaturation thing take care of itself where we've now got some leagues that are like one or two decent teams, then a bunch of tier two, then a bunch of tier three. So in that sort of a world, I don't see why... UK players would still have to use the old excuse of like, you know, there's no money in it and we can't go full time. Mm. I think enough of them now could play enough tournaments where there should be at least a competitive team, not on the level, like probably not going to be top 10 for a while, but okay, maybe like top 15. I think that would be reasonable expectation to be able to get there in a few months if the right lineup was together. And obviously mm. Rattlesnake's someone you'd want to be ideally a part of that because he's one of the only players in CSGO who's repeatedly been able to get to a decent level over and over again, was at a very good level at the beginning of CSGO particularly. Mm -hmm. has has history in terms of like leadership 
played a lot of tournaments. So if if it's going to be him, and you notice a lot of the old names aren't around anymore. I mean, like Weber's still around. Oh. There's a few there, but a lot of them have dropped off. A lot of them have just gone at AWOL. So if it's going to have to be like a newer set of players, younger guys, you want a couple of veterans mixed in there to, to help them along the way, I think. So that's pretty good. Oh, I yeah. also, just as a side note, I saw that oh. there was a team in the tournament called, uh, I believe, EasySkins.com. And I don't know why, but that just sounds shit. Like, I would actually recommend that no one ever goes to that website. I don't know why. I just feel that as it, like in my bones. So, <laughs> just thought I'd say that, Rich. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I got to say as well, what a, what a bizarre name. Uh, and hor- horrible good market, name is it? Yeah. No, no. Whoever came up with, with that. Uh, really needs to take a long hard fact, look at them. I believe that that's actually what the I buy power players actually said after they uh, <laughs> threw that game. They were just like, ah, "Fuck these plebs! These are easy skins." And that's actually uh, an homage to that. That incident is why the site was named that. I believe just just a negative connotation. Uh, yeah, so, really, really, so yeah, really. Important. In short, just stay away from it, guys. They're just bad guys, I reckon. So. Yeah, yeah, probably. Uh, who knows? I don't know anything about them. Uh, someone should research them, look into the background, I think. Sound like but a I bunch will... of fucking London wide boys just playing fast and loose with the rules and regulations, yeah. quite frankly, Rich. Yeah. Just like the bankers. I, 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 I can't sign off on that. I can't support that. Nah, nah. Um, so we'll move on to the next story. Now, this is one I know that actually uh, will have a potential impact on the fantasy drafting and perhaps even an impact on your heart here, Thorin. Uh, because obviously you're a big fan of Olaf Meister. Uh, he's had to have surgery on his right ear. Now, this is the player that, you know, everyone's like, Olaf Meister's the best player in the world right now, the best uh, overall player in the world right now. I don't think many people uh, contest that. Um, and he's had to have actual surgery on on his right ear for a, a problem that's been ongoing. Uh, there's been lots of jokes that, you know, he had some sort of hack, some sort of special cheat, cybernetic implant in his ear, and he's had to have it removed because Valve were getting on to it, you know, like that. But uh, but I actually, in a, on a serious note, he is going to be not playing for two weeks. Does have the potential to impact on Fnatic's uh, side? I think they've been they're going to use Devil Walk as a stand-in uh, or Khan as a stand-in, depending on who's available. They're both registered, and this this will be for all of the games that they're scheduled to play. Um, so, how do you think this is going to impact on them long term? I mean, is there a risk that this might affect Olaf Meister when he comes back? Could he be? You know, I, I, I know nothing about it. Could his surgery be a big deal for him when he gets back? And also, how is it going to impact on them in the short term, just in terms of ESL and ESCA Pro <clears throat> League? No, well, the first thing I thought when I saw this actually was kind of what you're referencing. Like, could it impact the long term? Because the obvious, the, the the surface of the story is like, okay, don't worry, guys. He's just out for a couple of weeks. And yeah, the main issue is like, how will they use the stand-in? But I'd be more concerned about the fact that we don't know what type of ear operation this is, because obviously with the ear, that can affect like balance. There can be all sorts of issues. If it's like, if he has any kind of like tinnitus or something, this could be a thing where it actually could shorten his career or make him worse in some sense. So that is a, that's a minor concern. I, I'll, I'll definitely say that because obviously at the moment, you don't want to take out the best player and ruin any possible chance of his current form continuing. You never know how, you also never know when someone hits that peak form, how long it'll last for. It can be, can sometimes mm-hmm. be just a couple of months, you know, and then they just go back to being a very good player, but not the best. So that is my, mildly concerning, but okay, at the moment, let's just assume it goes okay. And he does come back in a couple of weeks. I actually think that Fnatic's one of the few teams who can get away with this because particularly the games where they have Devil Walk play, Devil Walk plays anyway. Like he keeps his, he keeps his, keeps himself in the game in that sense. He does keep playing. And crucially, he was actually a member of the team and really did play with these other players before this player was there. So he's played with three of the other guys in the lineup. So I actually think in terms of teams that could put in a coach type guy and have a chance, they, they're the most ideally suited to do it. So I, it's not that I think that it'll be fine. I just think that they can still pick up some wins then. It's not like they automatically have to lose all the games because they lost all off. Well, and just added, been, just added been to that informed that put, as well. Yeah. Uh, they used Schneider today, okay. uh, who stood in and apparently had an amazing game. He absolutely owned it uh, by by all accounts. So uh, just yeah, just to put that there. I mean, bit, bit bit of a surprise. I don't know what the ins and outs of that are, but I think it's interesting because Schneider was a player, of course, that was potentially linked, you know, with moves to nip. He has been talked about in those big team. Uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, in a big team capacity, and uh, apparently he was like the the st- one of one of the standout players in the Fnatic performance. Well, I mean, again with Schneider, he was another guy who he's what he's. It was him and Devil Walk who were replaced by Crimson Olaf. So again, it makes sense in terms of you're even playing with the exact same players. So 
No, I mean, it's great for them. Obviously, they had a little bit of breathing room in terms of this came when they were like top of the league anyway. But in that league, it's so competitive, especially in the European division, that you can't, like, you couldn't afford like a three game skid, you know. So they still do have to get some results out of this period, even without Olaf Meister. That can't be the excuse because, in theory, this league going forwards is very important to get to the land finals of it. Mm. Um, and just uh, any any more thoughts about potential long term? You know, it's interesting. Like one of the things that doesn't really get talked about a lot, and yeah, I understand why. But it's, say, for example, in Nip, you've got Get Right, who's had lots of uh, health problems. Actually, uh, you know, he's had he's had an issue with his stomach, which has been ongoing. Um, and he's had to have all sorts of treatments for that. He had a very uh, bad recurring in ear infection as well, which he had to have treatments for that. Uh, his his health has really suffered. Uh, you know, it's fluctuated up and down over the last year, and yet Get Right's been just Mister Consistent. Like nothing has impacted on his ability to perform. You know, just time and time again, it's quite remarkable, really, when you think about other games and how even a slight health imbalance is brought up as being the ultimate excuse, the ultimate um, kind of reasoning behind a poor performance. But you know, is it, is there any chance that, you know, what if Olaf Meister does come back and he, he is a little bit out of sorts? How hard is that going to impact on Fnatic? Well, no, like, as you're kind of referencing here, I'm thinking in particular of games like StarCraft. If if any player ever mentions that they have RSI, that is forever the... They can now lose every game till the end of time because that can always be the yeah. excuse given every time they lose. Even if, for all we know, it was just a small bout and they got over it, you know? It's, there's an obvious correlation there where people can say if they're doing badly, the health implications were there. I agree with you. I think it's amazing how well Get Right's done considering that some of the problems were, were starting back when Nip was still winning tournaments. So he would win tournaments but have these major problems and somehow managed to get through it. I think in that sense... Even if even if this went the worst, okay, so it's some sort of problem that means Olaf isn't quite as good. Luckily, his game is so all around and so good, and he's such a versatile player. I think he could still find a way to contribute something to the team. And again, uniquely, Fnatic's one of the rare teams that have so many good players, they could probably still find a way to kind of like shift the resources onto someone else to be like a primary carry or play a certain mm -hmm. position. I think they could get around it, but... The main concern for me would be, will Fnatic, the team, be as good? Like, will they still be as great a team? Because at the moment, if like, let's say TSM does kind of fulfill their current destiny, okay? They become the next great team and they're the next number one team. You want it to be, like, entirely legitimate. Like, they took the crown from Fnatic or Fnatic were at their best and they beat them on fair ground and then that's why we seed them as, like, the next best team. You don't want it to ever be like, oh, but then, of course, Olaf Meister never came back quite the same and w what would have happened if Fnatic had had... That's, that's the only thing in terms of narrative that I would worry about. Out. Otherwise, yeah, I think Fnatic they could find a way around it, but it's true, maybe they won't be as good. So, uh, moving on, nice little segue again, uh, almost like we rehearse these things, which of course we don't, God forbid. Uh, we are now looking at a prospect of Get Right as an in game leader for NIP. Uh, this news was uh, announced, uh, again, an argument of it being a slow news day because we are seeing more and more top teams swap leaders quite often. But Get Right uh, is taking over in-game duties, which he's done before for uh, a short period of time. Um, and he says that the team, uh, well, I'll just read the quote. He goes, we had a long discussion at Gfinity where we went through a lot of stuff. We came to the conclusion that I was going to try out to be the caller. In the last few days, that is what I have done. It has been sort of a roller coaster for myself as I have to think about what everyone wants to do in games and such. It has been kind of tough, if you ask me, but I have great teammates that support me to the fullest. I do not feel weird with this new role anymore. Uh, sure, we may go back to Richard, that's exist, of course, being the main caller, or someone else, but for the time being, I will continue in this role. I hope I will get the best support from our fans. That was on his Facebook page. So we do know one of the things that can happen uh, is if you take over the calling role, it's such a weight, such a burden that if you are a big fragger, the fact you've got to focus on every little facet of the game, every other little meticulous detail that's going on as a map unfolds, it can detract from your concentration levels and mean that you're not as effective at fragging. And most recently, we've seen this with Shocks when he took over calling duties and Envious, and uh, we're going to talk about them a little later in the show. They've had a bit of a wretched time uh, under his stewardship. Do we think there's any risk of that happening uh, with Get Right taking over, either Nip or his personal level being affected. Like this is actually something that way back in 1.6 also briefly was discussed, which is at the end of Get Right's tenure in Fnatic, when they were having some issues where they were still in the top team, but they couldn't get, quite get past Navi at the time. They tried one tournament 
which is like a smaller Nordic tournament where they allowed Get Right to call on like a certain map or a certain half or something bizarre like that. And I don't think they liked the results. And then in CSGO, when they also had similar problems at the end of 2013, where they weren't winning tournaments, they tried him for one tournament. I think it was a Swedish Cup tournament in a small LAN in Sweden. And that was like, okay, results. The thing here is, on one hand, if you asked me from a, like a, an, an isolation, is this just a good move purely like if, say, forever he had to be the in-game leader, I'd say no, I th it's a bad move. Like, it doesn't make sense in terms of, well, what will exist bring to the table if it does impact Get Right's game a little bit? Like, is that worth it? Probably not, because Get Right's very good right now. Also, I don't think Get Right's really the sort of player I would pick to be the kind of cerebral mastermind type player. So that's an issue. And then, but the, the other factor I will bring up, though, is that, I suspect it's going to be like some of those other moves you referenced, like like Flusher taking over briefly, Shock's taking over for now, but maybe that will change, in that maybe it's just to give Exist a breather. Maybe it's just to see to, to try something new for a little while, see how it goes, but then the plan is, if if we need to, we go back to Exist again. If it's like that, then I have less of a problem with it. Like, I understand if you've played that many tournaments and you've had this same lineup, you, maybe you want to try something different. Maybe you want to do something different to give the other teams a different look. Okay, that's fine. But just as a pure, purely the move itself, I'm kind of skeptical that it will be that good. With that said, Nip isn't the most super tactical team anyway. They have used him for a bunch of games online. The results seem to be okay. So I don't think it's like the end of the world. It's just not ideal to me. Well, just to place that in context, just before we sort of, uh, well, while we were preparing for the show, and just before we went live, TSM absolutely demolished NIP 16-3. Now, okay, it was on overpass. This is, in, again, in the ESL, ESEA Pro League, which is what the show will focus predominantly on. And Get Right actually went, I believe it was 2 four nineteen, I think, overall over the course of the game. So lots of things before you can truly contextualize that. First of all, you're playing TSM, who are absolutely just runaway at the moment. They are, they are demolishing everybody. Uh, they, they, they look so, so good. Uh, on top of that, Overpass, not classically a good map for NIP. And of course, this is a new setup, so there is going to be this, uh, there is going to be this, if you like, honeymoon period where we're going to have to wait and see how it all works. But just on the surface of it, if we were to look at that in, in isolation rather than try and contextualize it, shaky start, and perhaps this could impact on uh, Get Right's performance moving forward. Yeah, the main concern for me, like I say, it's not even that Nip, it's not like Nip will have bad tactics results. Like I said, to me, they always run more default, like basic stuff that was individually triggered anyway. So I don't think it's that big a deal. It's more the effect on Get Right. That's my concern because to me, at the moment, his level's been really good again. He's right back to being one of the world's best players. And for Nip, you really rely on like give it, him giving you this consistent performance. So I'm more worried how it affects him more than how it affects him as the in-game leader. So if this happens more, then yeah, that, that can become a real concern. But obviously, yeah, it's short term. It's just a couple of online games. I don't think we can quite make a, a, a solid judgment on it quite yet. Okay. Um, so moving on to our final piece of news before we get into the uh, meat uh, of the show. Uh, just a little bit to talk about. It's more of a tangential thing. Uh, obviously, I wrote an editorial recently about e the ESEA client and its new insistence uh, that it, ha it now has to be active at all times. So it's changed from being this thing you log into and you turn on and off. It's now always active, like a persistent watchdog on your PC. Now, ultimately, I, I don't think I'd have too much of a problem with it if it was almost any other company behind it. But obviously, people know this, it's well documented, but maybe people are just joining. Back in 2013, April 2013, ESCA randomly just decided to turn their client into a Bitcoin miner uh, using malware in, in, in the client. And uh, obviously, this had a lot of negative effects on people's PCs. There were blue screens. There were uh, some hardware actually fried as a result of it. And... They did this completely without anyone's consent or knowledge. They just went ahead and did it for two weeks, raised $3,000 secretly before somebody was able to ascertain that it was a Bitcoin miner. And, of course, they went to a court case after this because LP Kane was just like, my bad, we'll buy back your love, you know, just living in that nouveau riche dream of his. Um, and they, they went to a court case and they were told that you're going to have to pay a $1 million settlement 
$350,000 of which was immediate and $650,000 of which was deferred, should they be able to keep their nose clean for 10 years, at which point it would be eradicated entirely. So I, I, I think this is interesting because I know for a fact that what's been going on behind the scenes, I don't think the players at, at the highest competitive level are, uh, have been too happy with this. And there was talks that today they actually held a meeting with ESEA and saying, we're not sure if we're comfortable basically signing away all of this rights to full access to our PC persistently with a tick of a box. And again, just to put it in context, in the court, uh, in, in, in the trial, if you read the court papers, the client uh, was made to copy files without people's knowledge. It was uh, allegedly took conversations without people's knowledge. This was, of course, a, a client that was used specifically to invade people's privacy under the pretext of uh, it stopping cheats. Now, what what do you think? I mean, is, is this is this an area where the team should draw a line? Or do you think that actually the ends justify the means? And if we create a cheat-free environment, then ESCA should be commended for that. Yeah, that's my big problem is like, I mean, first of all, the fact that it's ESEA is like a separate discussion from even the cheat aspect. Like, should cheats be allowed to access this much on your PC? And should people, should, that, that, that's like a, it should be its own isolated discussion. So just in terms of ESEA, one of my big problems with ESEA is I never bought that whole storyline that like it was a, lo a rogue employee who did all that and they knew nothing no. about it. Because from what I know about LP Kane, I actually worked at ESEA over a decade ago. He's a guy where one of the good things about him is he's for someone who's an owner, he's incredibly hands on because originally he was doing a lot of the tech. And so he's the sort of guy where he's right there on the ground floor, checking things out, seeing how things are implemented, running through them, making sure they're exactly kind of to his his tastes. Like in a weird way, I'd almost compare him to sort of like a Steve Jobs type figure. He wants to know about every detail of it and has to be done according to his specifications. So the idea is someone slipped something in there, activated it and would have apparently gotten away with it for weeks and weeks without him ever knowing. I never bought that angle. So that in itself then makes me a bit suspicious about the rest of the story. Then as you mentioned, the really concerning part is that in those court documents, it essentially says not that like it could have, you know, not like, oh, the concern is here. They could have copied files and they could have checked things on people's PCs. The documents say they did, that it actually happened. And that, so essentially that that's part of the record, that, that that isn't even disputable, you know, or couldn't be taken out by the lawyers of ESCA. So that, that in itself doesn't match up with their story, which was then like, oh, the court didn't understand anything about this and they totally misrepresented it's like i'm surprised you're even allowed to legally say that essentially because you essentially you've you've had to officially sign that like yeah this is all fine but then you just sort of essentially say oh it's a load of bullshit it's all wrong anyway but never give any specifics i notice so that in itself is one issue which is i don't think esea i put it so i wouldn't trust them i mean i mean what basis would i have to trust them after these things secondly mm -hmm. on the second issue you brought up of like can this create a cheap free environment I mean, in the most extreme example, it, I guess it could if the most perfect, pure and innocent and totally un unimpeachable individual was involved who never would use it corruptly, but in, can't, couldn't use the same logic in every area of life. Like, isn't this literally the same as saying the government should tap all of our phones, have cameras in every room of our house, and we'll just yeah. hope that they don't ever look at stuff or abuse their position to look at things of people they want to know about? I don't think any of us would trust any government to do that. So... I'd rather, if, if, if this was really the choice, I'd rather have some cheaters out there who we can't catch than everyone potentially have stuff stolen from their PC, rogue employees doing things, you know, like I, I don't trust people to do that. So I don't think it is worth it to get rid of cheats. And, and I've yet to see any proof that it will get rid of cheats. So I'm not even sure it's justifiable. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you as well. It's exactly that, isn't it? Like, you know, I, I, I agree. I think having the ESEA client operate uh, to this sort of d degree definitely will create a, a cheat-free environment. Indeed, you couldn't really put anything on your PC unless it was specifically created to evade the ESEA client without the ESEA client being able to detect it. Uh, and, and these can be benign files by all accounts, um, you know, or it, or, or it could be something more malicious. But what, what I find what I find interesting. Uh, about all of this is that the the pro players have kind of in, in the pro teams have got together and said we're not happy about this actually we we, we don't like this and uh, they've had meetings today uh, hang on let me just uh, tell you uh, what I've been told uh, and apparently the meeting said um, that the ESEA have assured the teams that uh, 
it can o the client can only actively see running processes in the CPU. It can't read files, emails, or any chat, uh, nor do they have the capability to do so. Which is very, in it's an interesting statement if ESCA have indeed said that, because we've got court transcriptions that prove the client could do that in 2013. So what's changed? Have they removed that capability? If so, why haven't they made that public? I certainly would. I think that would go a long way to building some trust and mending some fences, right? Sure. And also, listen, by the way, I will actually ac acknowledge that it's possible that the court did not understand some of the technology. And maybe the other lawyer, the prosecution, was just very convincing in how he told them, like, oh, this person can do this, this, this and this. Because in the 90s, I read a lot of books that were about the cases of the early computer hackers who got arrested mm. by the go American government. And that would happen a lot of the time with them, is that you'd have some really slick talking prosecution guy and he would sell the judge who didn't know much about the Internet on the idea that, like, listen, this guy, if you even gave him access to a phone he could whistle and like launch a nuclear bomb down the you know all sorts of absolutely wild like james bond movie type stuff that probably wasn't possible so i could believe that some of some of the core aspects could be a bit off but like you're saying i, th I think if they if, if esea wants to remove this kind of perception of them that they can do all this stuff if i were them i'd go and like i just mentioned here and first of all explain what they meant by the court was wrong and all this stuff and they didn't understand the technology because otherwise who are we going to trust the court or you like it's it's a difficult choice and then secondly yeah the big issue i have here is mm. it, it, it is kind of comforting if it's true that they can't just look at your email and watch you log into your bank and stuff that's that is that would be very good but that's another area where it being a SEA is a problem. Because if the person who I first encountered on this information, where I heard this news, okay, this client can check all the stuff on your PC. But if the first point of entry with the SEA is this really reasonable person who says, listen, I, we do not want to look at stuff on your PC. In fact, we've purposely designed this client, so we can't do that. It only checks processes, and we're only going to look at like what is running and see if like an extra thing's been activated. If someone said it like that, it would actually allay a lot of my fears, whether it was true or not. The problem with the SEA is that's never your first first point of contact your first point of contact is always lp kane sort of being like yeah if you don't like it get the fuck out and i'll do it you know it's it's always that sort of a tone that like makes you think like well i, I can't trust this person actually because he's sort of telling me to go fuck myself unless i want to just <laughs> submit to everything he says so i've not i mean that's just an esea <laughs> problem or just a pr problem with them because i, I don't know how you're going to get over that part because i'm always i'm always going to think of like the lp kane responses unfortunately yeah and they have become like little finger at this point in time <laughs> Well, look, so I, I think it's an interesting topic of debate. It's it's going to rage on. I think some people feel my stance is a little bit harsh. You know, I, I do support a boycott. I personally think that ESEA, what they did for me, I think it's the most egregious abuse of trust I've seen in 10 years of esports reporting. And I've seen it all, you know, like going from the, the rather bog standard now days of Angel Munoz, uh, just not paying out prize money uh, and say, don't fill my massive luxury mansion right up into the modern day where you've got organizations like MYM saying, it's okay, we'll just take your mother's house, not a problem. I, I've seen it all, you know, like, uh, and, and I, I'm, I think this is number one. I think it's, I think it's insane, actually, uh, to, to, to have done it. But that's me. Doesn't mean I'm right. Um, and obviously some people disagree, and there's lots of proponents of ESEA. And indeed, it's got to be said to counterbalance that point, where would North American CS be without ESEA? especially in a barren post-CGS era. It's not that it's all bad. There is no black and white to this. It's just that, for me, that was an abuse of trust. I should have seen them kind of publicly flogged every day uh, for, the, for, the, for the two years uh, subsequently since they did it. Uh, anyway, let's, let's move on. Now, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to focus mainly on the ESL, ESCA Pro League. Um, no, no, no link there. My, my views are my own about their client and public flogging. That's, that's just me. Uh, and we'll focus on the EU region first, because obviously me and Thorin are biased towards that region. Uh, we hate Americans, obviously. That, that's, that's, that's what the chat says, so it must be true. Um, so let's look at the standings, first of all, uh, for the European region. I'm sure uh, my, my fine producer will bring that up. Uh, and you can see... Uh, that while at, while uh, since our last show, uh, a lot a lot has changed. There's some big talking points here that we'll sort of get to. NIP uh, have knuckled down and played a lot of games, uh, and up until the the sort of uh, recent capitulation against TSM that happened just prior to us going on air, it's been pretty good. They've powered their way uh, into the top of the league with 24 points from 14 matches played. Next, we've got TSM. Then it's Fnatic, Avertus Pro. Dignitas, Mouse Sports, 
Envious and Na'Vi right down there. Titan as well. And then you've got the Bargain Basement, which I think everyone would expect, which is Hellraiser's Penta and Flipside. So your thoughts on these standings, Duncan? I mean, I know not everyone's played an equal amount of games yet, but there's two names that stand out to me straight away. Uh, and that is, of course, our Gallic friends, Envious and Titan, languishing right down there when these are teams that, you know, have put in decent land showings lately. And yet in this online league, they don't seem to be having the best of times. Yeah, especially when you look at the company Envious is in. Envious is in the same company as Mouse Sports, who have a brand new lineup, and Hellraisers, who in theory lost by far their best player when Simple left and then Flamey left as well. So so they, they've been losing all their talent, and that's where Envious is around. Envious is below Dignitas. And Dignitas was a team that looked, were, were scrambling to even break into kind of Tier 2 recently. So, no, this is absolutely terrible. So when you combine it with the land problems they've had, uh, I mean, obviously not massive land problems, but some, but a, a decrease a decrease in form certainly. I, okay. I, it's certainly a concern. Let me There's let me a lot of work to do. Let me contextualize it. So let's talk about the results since we last did our show. Uh, they got humbled by Nip sixteen five on cobblestone, right? Which is, I mean, that's always. I mean, that's been a pretty good map for Envious actually. Uh, you know, it's not not their best map, but certainly it's one they've never shied away from. They've done quite well on it. It's not a particularly standout map for Nip, but they got wrecked on it. Uh, then on top of that, and I think this is perhaps the most surprising of all, they lost to Mouse Sports 16-10 on Mirage. I mean, this is, it, I, I will point out that they have played less games than some of the teams around them. So there is they've still got some games. Like, for example, on Mouse Sports, they've got a whole bunch of games in hand. So... That that maybe isn't quite as bad as it looks because you'd expect them to win some of the games they've got in hand, mm -hmm. but yeah, some of these losses. That's the thing. If if it, one of the ways you could have given them kind of an out is if they just had a run that was really sick. Like say they had to play Nip, TSM, Fnatic versus Pro all in a row, and then they'd lost three out of the four games or something. You'd say, okay, fair enough. That the schedule will kind of even itself out. But like you're saying, some of the losses are to teams that aren't the elite teams. So mm. that in itself goes the other way and says, well, if you lose it to those teams, now if you lose any of your games to the bigger dogs, you're pretty much done already. So they're definitely in some trouble right now. Yeah. I mean, uh, do, do we do, can we pinpoint a problem uh, with this? I'm going to quickly uh, bring up some statistics uh, which we can sort of contextualize while we're talking about this. But has anything stood out to you, Duncan, when you've been watching the games? Is there any ongoing problem that you think, actually, th this is where the trouble lies? I mean, the fact that Shox has taken over in-game leader simultaneous to his game kind of dropping off a bit, it had already, he'd already slightly decreased a bit in the last few months beforehand. But ever since he became the in-game leader, it seems like individually he just hasn't been much of a factor at all. And so that's one issue. Then you add in the fact that I think NBK every now and then has had a bad game. Yeah, the overall team level in this team isn't high enough. Whereas what we used to get them by before was they weren't the guy, they weren't the team who had to have one guy do great all the time. Happy was very consistent, but otherwise it was always like a rotating door of like, this guy has a good game. Okay, don't worry about it. The next guy will pick up the slack on the next map. Oh, on this particular map on T side, Smith's is good here. NBK is good on CT side. In front. You know, the, the, everyone would have their spot to kind of show what they're, what they're made of. Well, at the moment, Kiyoshima usually does pretty well. Happy still has good games, but then the others just take it in turns to be bad. And so I think that's the bigger issue for me is as a, as a team level, there's something going on there. So, I mean, we, we've talked a little bit about the science of sort of drafting people in uh, and, and, it, <coughs> you know, and, and, and how you need to think about things when you're doing a fantasy draft. So it's not just about, you know, oh, which players are going to have the best performances, who's going to win, although that is part of it. Equally, what you want to get the most points, to kind of milk the most points is you want to look at a matchup and you want to say, well, okay, this is going to be quite close. It's going to be lots of rounds, lots of bomb plants, lots of you know clutches, maybe even an overtime. That's how you need to be thinking about it. So you've got to think about the matchup and not just the players. That said, you would have expected this week, in a week where uh, they, they were playing like Flipside, uh, Mouse Sports, NIP, which should have been a close game between them, this would have been a good week to draft envious players. Now... Flipside gave them a, a default win, I believe. Uh, so that's going to skew the stats there. But then it, it's not good reading. Actually, Shox, for example, someone who we think of as this mad fragger, 
how many kills would you say he's getting per game? Go on, this week. Probably something terrible, like nine. 6.75 average kills per game. Uh, and obviously, I can say that does include a uh, you know default win, so that skews it, that pushes it out, so just to contextualize it. Uh, but uh, yeah, and that means he's getting 4.5 points for you a game. So right now, Shox is a, a poor pick. And it's not like, oh, well, you can say everyone else on the team is is, is doing uh, especially well either. Uh, Happy, who is someone you would uh, usually bank on, he's 1.75 points per game. So two points a game this week. Not a great showing from him. Best player at the moment, just in terms of pure fantasy drafting, is MBK, 11 points per game, which is still pretty low if we look at the uh, European average. So... Uh, in incredible really i mean I, I i don't think it can stay like this forever i still believe there's too much talent in the team but it's got to be said if you look at recent disappointing land performances you know failing to get out the groups at gfinity you contextualize that with the sort of we're trying out shocks and as a leader it's not working the team have been a little bit disappointed and down on themselves a little bit deflated and then results like say the 16th of mouse sports who i expect to be right down there come the bottom of this season i think we can now safely say there's enough en uh, there's enough evidence to say envious have serious problems especially because this is the first time an online league really did matter like in the past no one actually did really bat an eyelid if some team failed to make star ladder offline finals even esea sometimes if they didn't make it because we knew not every team even would end up going in terms of how much it cost it actually didn't matter even if you were a, a top five top four team if you didn't make these land finals there'll be enough lands otherwise that it wouldn't matter but since this league is being presented as this massive collaboration of these cr transatlantic partnership and it's going to be the, this big affair and in theory, it's going to become the main league that goes alongside all the other land tournaments and the majors. It Making the land finals of this tournament is important. And I have to figure for someone like the owner of Envious, who's who's been used to a ridiculous scenario where his team finished top four every land tournament and we're usually in with a chance to win these tournaments, it probably will be a big deal for him in terms of if we're not making the finals of these land tournaments and I've seen other issues, may, maybe that's where he gets involved and says, do we need to change something up? Because... Yeah, that's the thing. A lot of people in esports, actually as an analyst, it's a lot easier to say, oh, give this a little bit of time. It'll work itself out. A lot of players, they really do go result by result day by day. And so if things go really badly on one day, we see players and teams make drastic moves that maybe in the long term would have sorted themselves out, but they just want to change something now and they want to make it so that tomorrow it's fixed. So that's my concern with their team is can they just come through this period and we'll all just look back and go, OK, they had a slight slump, but they figured something out or will, will something drastic happen here? Yeah, well, so here's something else I think we should talk about. It doesn't really get talked about a lot, but I think it's worth I think it's worth bringing up um, the the game the game house the the team house. Uh, and I know Hastro's been really really keen to get this team house going together. He's got what what looks. I mean, I've seen some sneak uh, previews of the photos of it. It's like a, a glorious mansion in the south of France, basically. But he's it, it's been, you know, getting it finalized and getting all the paperwork done. It's really been dragging out. There's all these like weird tax taxation laws and they need to see all of these like to prove it's a business, they gotta bring out all their accounts for like god knows how many years and stuff. Do we think that if Envious get in there and get into this, you know, glorious mansion? that's going to help them. Like Once they're in a team house environment, that could be the catalyst to get them back to being the envious that we know they can be. See, the issue here is that team houses in terms of living in team houses haven't really worked because the main team that tried it was Titan. And famously, that's what led to Shocks actually leaving Titan, which broke up really their golden era of when they could be the best team. So mm -hmm. the, main, the main concern is that supposedly... It's these guys from Envious aren't going to repeat the same mistakes. So they're going to use the team house mainly as a boot camp area. And the idea is now they just have a specific place that they're going to be comfortable in and they go there every time and they boot camp there. Then they go to the land. So I think it can help the land performance. Maybe that can fix things there. But in terms of this, like day to day performance, which is more what the online leagues are, I'm not sure it will actually affect it much. Maybe it helps to be able to meet in person and have conversations, but 
I don't know about that. I think a lot of in-game issues sometimes get too conflated with like the personality things and how people feel about things. Sometimes in-game form is just a player's playing badly and you have to kind of in isolation look at it and go, right, well, can we keep this player? Is there a way to still get him, get use out of him or do we have to remove him? And so I don't know if they're a team that, that's willing to do that right now. Mm. Uh, one of the ongoing problems as well is, you know, when you play in a lot of online competitions, especially in countries like France, where maybe the internet isn't so developed, that can be a factor. You know, uh, some of the players have intimated they're not satisfied with how you know that their internet right now, and that's why they're really looking forward to getting into this team house because it'll have this, you know, su you know super fast business uh, connection. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you on, on your thoughts on team houses. They seem to be a bit of a lottery and it depends on the individuals. Like, you know, if it, they can be a really good structured practice environment. They can help a team bond. There's lots of extra time for practice. There's extra time to do things together collectively. Sometimes it can be good. And then other times, actually, the team house environment can be something that just piles on additional problems. Like, for example, someone's level of cleanliness it's one thing to have to play with them but to live with somebody is actually a very different thing you know like it, when you play with them it doesn't matter whether they're the kind of guy who's going to do the dishes or not or well are they the kind of guy who's going to leave you know dirty underpants in the living room while you're bringing a honey home or whatever you know these are these are all i'm sure you can identify with that duncan uh uh you know more from the honey side rather than the dirty pants side but the the, the issue can be you know little things like that suddenly translate into game and you're just thinking, this motherfucker with the dishes. And, you know, th that extra anger, that extra tension can actually be the downfall of teams. It's happened numerous times. And I think just in turn, I mean, I've seen in other games where it's default, like League of Legends, where you get a team house. That I think for most Western teams, it's not that good an idea because of the reasons you're saying here. Like, it'll just cause personality conflicts to become a factor within the team environment where they wouldn't exist if you weren't with each other all the time. If you only met during practice time, most people can be professional then and just do their job knowing that when practice ends, they can go away and do whatever they want for the next, whatever, 15 hours, 12 hours before they have to meet that guy again. Whereas if that guy is literally just right in your face and you have to look at him every time out the corner of your eye and you have to meet him every time as you go to the kitchen, then it, then it, it becomes a factor where that can now be a problem. And so to me, the sorts of teams who could get away with actually fully on living in a team house would be have to be someone like, I would guess someone like Fnatic, where, to be fair, a bunch of them are quite, fairly quiet. They're just nerds. They would probably just keep themselves to themselves. That's the sort of team I could see it working on. Teams that have more, like, bigger personalities. Like, I'll give you an example of a team I think would be terrible. If you put Virtus Pro in a team house oh, and they had God. to just live together every day, I don't, I don't think that team would go, like, three months without a roster change. That, I think it's that almost be, certain. That would be the first esports murder right there, I think. But you, you know, but you, I, know I, you can see kind of the way I'm characterizing it here, like the sorts yeah. of personalities that could get away with it, I think. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just uh, a few thoughts about Titan as well. You know, we, we've been we've been impressed with Titan's progress. We think they're getting better, right? So I know they've only played five games. So it, again, their position's a little bit deceptive. But again, they're another team that in their most recent outing, you know, they lost to Mouse Sports. 16-8 uh, on train, you would, I mean, okay, maybe it's the train an anomaly, but you, you would, Titan is somebody that we, uh, very high up in your top 10, uh, somebody you would certainly expect to be beating Mouse Sports, even though we do expect Mouse Sports to kind of come out flying the flag for Germany a little bit more now that uh, they've got a stronger roster. But, um, I mean, do we, do we think Titan uh, have anything to worry about right now, especially coming off the back of uh, Gfinity? I think Titan are okay in as much as they are one of the teams that have played the least. And so they don't actually have that bad a record for having played so little. And crucially, one of the, the key contacts that I would add is they played one of the first, I think they actually played the first ever game in this league where they lost to Dignitas quite shockingly. So, okay, that's yeah. bad. Dignitas is a team that you'd had down on your calendar, like we can beat them. But that was really early on. So actually since then, the record's been pretty good. I feel like if they get enough games, they'll be, they'll be safe. The big problem they have is that to get into that top four is going to be hard for them anyway. Like they can't really drop many games because they, they can't take for granted that if they play TSM, Fnatic vs. Pro, Envious, that they win these games. So for them, they really have to kind of pick up every every gimme. They have to get all the bad teams they pretty much have to beat. And then they have to get a couple of upsets. So my issue for them is more that it could be a sign down the road that they have issues because they're going to have to have a very good performance to get into that kind of top four position. Mm. And just to put it into context again, for the benefits of anyone that's playing 
uh, in alpha draft. Uh, obviously, Titan haven't played a lot of games, so it hasn't been a great week um, for them. But in terms of points, uh, with that loss against Mouse Sports, which was fairly, you know, it, I, I'd say 16-8, it's fair to describe that as comprehensive. It's not an absolute mauling, but it is comprehensive. Um, Maniac uh, stood out, I, and, and I just brought this up because I know you'd like it uh, in particular. Uh, obviously, I, I, I'm less malicious than you. But um, average points per game for him, minus five. So he which, loses you points. Which doesn't actually go along with what we've seen off offline recently. Offline, the last few months, he's been one of the most consistent players in the team. And in other, here's the problem. For this specific tournament, we're talking only about ESEA, ESL here. In other online competitions, actually, Kenny's overcome a lot of his land problems where he had these issues yeah, yeah. he found in the highlight rounds. But actually, in ESEA, it hasn't really transferred that much. Admittedly, again, they haven't played that many games, but he hasn't really had the stellar performances in this league. So specifically for this league, it's not really time to just go all in on Kenny S necessarily because, I mean, he, he's obviously going to be one of the more expensive players, you'd think. Well, yeah, well, let's have a look at Kenny S. He is certainly one of the more expensive players. I, I might be able to tell you how much his salary is. I'll just see if I've got that to hand. Um, so I believe he's currently at 8,600. Obviously, uh, the salaries can subject uh, fluctuate depending on when you, you get them. But again, for that level of investment, which is one of the you know, top-end salaries for a player, uh, he's currently bagging you, again, based on this week, he would have got you 5.5 uh, points per game he played. So... Again, really, you know, right down the pack in terms, and again, obviously they've not played a lot of games. It's from a small sample size, but just in terms of raw numbers, uh, not somebody. I think he managed to get fourteen kills against Mouse Sports, so not uh, not not a great showing. And this is a guy who a few months ago would have been like on my first pick for most of these play days. Like I know even in a loss, he can get kills. He's going to get his numbers no matter what. You know, whether the Titan wins or not was a different matter. So. Yeah, he's a player where, at the moment, at least for the ESEA ESL Pro League, may, maybe just d don't invest yet on Kenny. Let's see where he goes in the next few games. Okay, so let's move from the bad to the good. Let's talk about TSM. Uh, just rolling up the league at the moment. TSM are the team uh, with the most points. Uh, so out of out of any of the teams that are, if we were to have all five of the players and we were to add up all of their fantasy points, TSM has almost double the number of points than their closest competitor. So they've got 6,091 points total distributed uh, among their players uh, uh, overall. And Fnatic, 3,152. So quite a phenomenal statistic. TSM players are definitely ones to have in there. Um so let's uh, let's let's break this down uh, and go over some of the results they've had. We just talked a little bit about their 16-3 uh, demolition of NIP. Uh, they also beat uh, Dignitas on cash 16-13, which I actually think, given that that's Dane on Dane action, that's actually quite impressive because that's one of the scenes where everybody actually does you know sort of know each other. Um, you know, so well. It's like when two French teams play. Everything's up for grabs, you know? So I, I think that's actually, especially because it's a grudge match, I think that's an impressive result in and of itself. They absolutely beasted. Uh, let me have a look. Uh, I think, yeah, that was uh, after our show. So yeah, they beasted Flipside 16 1, beat Penta 16 8, and of course, there was that overtime win against Fnatic 1915. This has helped power them into second place. Uh, seven wins from ten matches played. Uh, do we now need to start thinking about TSM as are they the second best team in the world? Are they just behind Fnatic right now? I mean, with how things are going right now, they actually have hit that level that not many teams have hit in CSGO, which is that the online performance is stellar. And it's linking up with some amazing offline performance. Usually the two don't always sync up that well. Like actually what's interesting is Fnatic's first period when they had this lineup, when they were beasts online, was when they had some problems in offline tournaments. They hadn't won a big offline tournament. And then when they became the dominant team, actually sometimes they'd lose to LDLC. Sometimes Dignitas was still up there. Virtus Pro. It's not actually that often that you're the monsters online and offline simultaneously. So at the moment, the fact that it is lining up for TSM at the moment and they're still continuing to beat Fnatic, 
you, you can't say they're the best yet. They still need to do a bit more offline. But but they essentially, they, they're kind of like set up for the coronation. It's like they've got everything lined up and you can see the next steps they need to take and they're taking them at the moment and everything's still rolling along smoothly where they, they really could become the best team in the world, I think. Yeah, and what's amazing is how competitive they are in all games. So no matter what the matchup is, no matter who they're playing, they get an average, and this, of course, is just in the ESL, ESEA Pro League, but they get an average of 13 rounds a game. So they're always in it. They never, they never get blown away. And that, that is, you know, that for me is the sign of a good team. The fact that even against the very best, even in the games they lose, they're still posting really high numbers, really, you know, decent, you know, they're getting a decent amount of rounds. And something that's changed from the old TSM is that they've got they've got that quality that the great CSGO teams had, which is that you have to have like the really wide one map pool. So it's gotten now so that in the past, TSM Dignitas was good on two or three maps. You knew they'd have a chance versus everyone on these maps. It's getting now so they can play almost anything and they can win yeah. as well. And that, that's when a team really gets scary because then you don't even know what to do in the, in the draft against them if you're in an offline tournament. Mm. And that's reminiscent of the old NIP that were competitive on every map. That's exactly how Fnatic are now. They have a much more sizable map pool than anybody else. If TSM can get to that level, I think this team's you know going to be really scary. And just imagine it, Duncan. Imagine when you're there writing your top 10 and you've got to give TSM that number one spot. How's it going to feel? Hey, uh, what people don't realize is it's not actually TSM players in any game that I particularly dislike. It's just the people who own the team, the coaches of the teams, and all the fans. So actually, the one set of people I don't mind, Rich, is the players. <laughs> I have no problem giving them their due, due props, you know. Oh, well, that's, that's good to know. Good to know. I am looking forward to seeing how your next uh, top 10 But the thing is, outside. In, in line with what you're saying here, this actually ties into the first topic we discussed here, which is if Envious is slumping a bit, if Nip's having their own issues and changing things up, yeah. that also just makes it so that at this point, who's going to stop TSM becoming the best team? There's only really Fnatic can do it. And if it turns out Fnatic's some weird, like TSM's their kryptonite, maybe that's how TSM just takes that top spot from them. Yeah. And it's going to be exactly, those two exactly teams right. at the moment, it feels like. Yeah, I mean, so, some, sometimes it's not just about you developing and progressing, which TSM obviously are. But it's also about what the other teams around you are doing as well. And people are slipping. People are struggling. There is a little bit of a power vacuum right now. You know, once you get past Fnatic, who else is there? And, of course, TSM, they're doing, they're doing really, really well against Fnatic right now. You know, people are even starting to say TSM are like Fnatic's kryptonite. Just stylistically, it's always a good matchup. But TSM edge it and always have the better of it. You know, you're absolutely right. If that's the case, then they might, uh, they might just nick it. Might nick that number one spot. We'll have a quick look ahead at results, uh, sorry, uh, fixtures that are coming up uh, before we move to the NA region. Um, so let's do it. So I think we'll start with uh, tomorrow's games because obviously some of the games are ongoing right now. Uh, interesting, uh, just, to, just to let you know that uh, Titan are going to be playing flip side very shortly today uh, while we're still going to be doing the NA portion of this broadcast. Uh, any thoughts on that? I mean, Titan have got to be flip side, right? On the voting on the ESL, ESEA website, people have it at 50-50. The Ukrainians are out in force. I mean, the thing is, flip side are very good online. So, yeah, that is one of those games where, in line with what I said before, if you're Titan, you have to try and pick that up because, again, you can't take it for granted. You're going to beat TSM, Fnatic, etc. when you play them. So you really have to pick this up. But Flipside's a very dangerous opponent, specifically for teams like Titan. I mean, skill-wise, Flipside's going to be right there with a team like Titan. So I could see this being a real danger match. I could also see it being, it being very close. In fact, actually, sorry, I've misread that. That 50-50 isn't the public vote. The 50-50 is their record, I think, on, okay. on the maps. Uh, when they or No, their record's against each other. So I think Flipside have already beaten Titan once this season. I think that's what it is. Uh, it's a bit of a confusing website. So, yeah, Flipside must have already took a win against them. Is that right? I'll double-check that. But, uh, but yeah, t tell me just a bit more while I do. Why you think, I mean, it, uh, you know, how Flipside can possibly win that? Well, first of all, they amazingly, I never thought I'd be able to say this when they're playing Titan, but in an online game, Simple will be the best player in this. Actually, he doesn't play in this league, right? Uh, well, I don't think he can, no. He's yeah. banned. Okay so, okay, so that's a factor I should actually take into account. Let me think. Hmm. Well, okay. The first things first, they're both teams that rely mainly on like good tactics. They both have really good execution. Two of the better in-game leaders in terms of the old style of play. So that alone will help you get 
more more rounds out of your T side. You're not going to run into as many problems. Not having simple is an issue. Like actually, if it, if, I, if it was simple on flip side, I might even say flip side would win this. Titan's been playing pretty well recently online. The fact it's Inferno, that's a that's a good sign for Titan. That's one of their best maps. Yeah. But flip side is going to be pretty decent on that as well. I think this actually is a very close match. I would expect this to be whoever wins. It'll be like a 16, 12, 16, 13 type scoreline. I think I'll edge yeah. it to Titan though, actually, since there's no simple. So we, I've just had the producer quickly check the score. It's being played now, actually. Uh, I forgot that the time zone is obviously for mine. I'm not, I'm not Central European. So it's being played right now. Uh, and Titan lead 8-5 on T-side Inferno. Um, so looking good for them. Obviously, we'll give updates uh, as that happens. Uh, the game that's going to be on after that is Mouse Sports versus Na'Vi. Uh, now, just to contextualize what's been going on there, uh, Mouse Sports, as we've alluded to, they had a good run. They picked up some results against teams that we thought we, they probably shouldn't. That was against France. They beat their German rivals and indeed some of the old roster of Penta, 16-2 on Cobblestone. They lost 16-9 to Dignitas. Then they lost 16-10 to Nip. And they just lost 16-9 to Hellraisers. So all of a sudden, all that good work they've done has been undone by a run of three defeats. Um, so this is a very important game for them. How do you see this one going? I mean, the thing is, Na'Vi have so much talent in their team that you would think Na'Vi should win. Like, it should be a, a convincing win. But Mouse Sports, first of all, the map is Cash. And the Mouse Sports, you have to remember, is made up of mainly the old Penta players. And Cash was their map. That was one of their best maps. They actually, they ha they could play that fairly well. So I think that mm. can give some danger to, to the Na'Vi guys. With that said... I, I feel like in the online competition, Mouse Sports, it's not that they're onliners, but they're going to be a bit better compared to some of the other top European teams. But I think Navi still should be able to beat them. Uh, Got to say as well, while we're talking about onliners, uh, if you had Chris J in your in your team this week, which I can't... Im thing is, on the one hand, I'm saying, I can't imagine why anyone would do that. But perhaps in an online competition where obviously he feels more comfortable. I'd, I'd have him, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Maybe. I think Chris J is not a bad pick. And the numbers bear it out. An average of 20 kills per game uh, to 16 deaths uh, and 30 points average. Uh, so, I, I, again, I think I, what, a, what a great pickup he would be for a, for a fantasy team. He's been one of the best, uh, one of the best players uh, overall for Mouse Sports. But somebody is even better than him. So who would you say that would be? On Mouse Sports? Yeah. I would assume Troubly. No, 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 no. Uh, let's it? have a look. So, according oh, actually, to... Actually, uh, does Trouble even play for Mouse Sports? He might be playing for no, Penta now. He, he's at Penta now. So, that's all right. It's all right. It's hard to keep up with uh, the Germans. But uh, Nex has been Nex, absolutely okay. insane. So, if you had Nex in your team this week, and let's have a look. Uh, how much would he have cost you in terms of salary? 7500 middle of the pack. He would have got you uh, 42 points for each game he played, uh, posting 25 kills a game average across quite a, quite a large sample size as it happens. Uh, how many games did they play this week? Uh, so, yeah, and that's, that's across uh, four games. So he's an absolute monster at the moment, and his salary is still fairly low for what he's delivering in terms of numbers. So I, I, I've got to say, though, Na'Vi, very different prospect, but they haven't played for a while. They've been a little bit, uh, since Gfinity, they've been kind of off the radar a little bit, been off the grid, uh, and haven't played a lot of games. Uh, so there is a chance that Mouse Sports, having just had a game against Hellraisers, they could, you know, it could be a good time to play Na'Vi. They could catch them cold. I think also that you, this is an area where in this particular type of thing, this this online competition specifically, you need that's where you can actually get a lot of value. Is there's certain players and teams who are going to perform better online. And it's not that it's just a random fluctuation. They just gen generally tend to be a bit better. So we're thinking of teams like in the past, well, in leagues where Simple can play, Flipside's a great example. Mouse Sports, historically always been a good online team. 
These are teams where you can get a little bit of edge by knowing, for example, that Chris Jay is always a good online player. He's always he's always, always nuts online. So if it was a land tournament, I'd tell you, don't waste your money on him. Almost no matter where he's ranked, it's probably not going to be worth it. But actually, this is an area where you can probably carve out a little niche and you can be a bit ahead of the game where you, a lot of the other people playing the game will be going off land results and they'll be thinking like, right, I'll put all my money into like, you know, Shocks, Kenny S, the, these players who, who would have been the proven land players in the past. Mm. So we'll quickly jump to tomorrow's game day and then we'll switch to the NA region. So we'll go through these quickly. I'll just get you some uh, some, some quick thoughts. Uh, Na'Vi are going to play Mouse Sports again in a double header, so we don't really need to go into that. Then Mouse Sports are going to come up against TSM. I probably is not going to need to ask you your thoughts on that one. What map does Na'Vi play, TSM, Na'Vi play Mouse on? So Na'Vi have got them tonight on cash and then train oh. next up. Right, Train so, is a very interesting one there because I have no idea what Mouse would be like on Train. And I know Na'Vi played that, and I think that was the map that they actually smashed Liquid on. So I would assume I'd, I'd be favoring Na'Vi there. And what was the yeah. other match? Uh, and the other match is Mouse Sports TSM on Cobblestone. Yeah, now this is interesting because we don't really know what TSM's like on Cobblestone. We haven't really seen them playing that. But still... As we've already outlined, TSM at the moment is just un un unbelievable no matter what. It's not on this map, and if this player does it, just the whole team is on fire. The whole style's clicking against everyone. In some senses, I think they're almost setting like a new meta to some degree, so I would still probably pick them to win this game. Mm. Uh, game of the day, uh, in my opinion, on Thursday, is going to be Titan versus Virtus Pro on Overpass. So not a map that's been particularly kind to uh, to either of them. Uh, I think that's a really tough one to call, actually. Got to be said, Virtus Pro having a little bit of a renaissance. They've had some good results uh, there. Um, although I, I believe in the Fragbite uh, League, I think it was, they just got beat by Fnatic with Schneider as the stand-in. I think it was Virtus Pro they were playing. Uh, but Virtus Pro are fourth in the ESL ESEA Pro League with 18 points from seven games played. They've won six of them. So, I mean, technically, they're, they're, they've probably got the highest win rate, uh, win percentage overall, I'd probably say, uh, out of any of the teams there, apart from Fnatic. So, I mean, they are, they are in a good run of form. Meanwhile, we've already talked about Titans' problems. The thing is, Overpass has quietly been a pretty decent map overall for the Virtus Pro guys. I mean, I remember that that was the map they won against Nip in the semifinal at Face It. So there is a map that they have been able to get some wins on. They're, they're mm -hmm. decent on it. It's not by any means their best map, not, not close. So in terms of the two teams, yeah, I would actually favor VP on this one, I think, because actually that's been a map where I don't think of that as one that Titan ever veer onto. So I think that's one where they're going to have... And Virtus Pro are a better team than Titan, so I think that VP should be able to win this. Uh, in terms of, uh, again, just to, just to bring in, if you were bringing in a player from Virtus Pro this week, uh, let me have a look for you and tell you, well, it's quite hard because the sample size isn't great. Uh, but so far, the and this won't surprise you at all, the statistically best performers on Virtus Pro, the ones that are going to bring home the bacon for you if you put them in your team, uh, is going to be Bialy or Snacks. And here's what's interesting, actually. In terms of salary, Bialy is 6,200. No, that sounds like a steal then, because he's he's someone especially, and I, I would assume in, Virtus Pro is also counter to how the old players were in 1.6. In 1.6, they were famous in the team that were amazing online, offline rather, but actually always struggled online, partly because of internet issues, etc. Whereas in CSGO, this new lineup that has Bialy, has snacks on it, has always been very good online, actually. They've repeatedly been able to do very well in online competitions, sometimes beating teams who, who beat them on LAN. So I would I would say for that sort of money, Bialy's probably a steal going forwards as well. Like he's someone who's going to have a lot of good performances. Mm. So uh, the, the last two games tomorrow will be Dignitas versus Flipside on Dust 2. I've got to say you've got to favor the Danes on that one, right? Yeah, I think so. Dignitas at the moment seem to be in a pretty good run of form. It seems like they get, they, they're powering up as they go on. And Flipside, as we mentioned, without Simple, that they're a team that should be beatable for them in this current run of form, I think. Mm. And Dust 2. And Did you say it was on Dust 2? Yeah, Dust 2, yeah. Well, that, that, I mean, that's the, the Danes... map. Dignitas is loving that map at the moment. That's a map yeah. where Nico can go to work. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, yeah, it is Nico's playground. You're absolutely right. Uh, 
And then the final game will be Penta Sports versus Dignitas on Dust 2. So more of the same. I'd, I'd probably say, actually, again, just thinking about creative drafting, get Nico in your team for, for, for this week. Because if they've got two Dust 2 games against opposition in the bottom two of the league, Nico's going to smash people a bit, surely. Yeah, I think that's good, especially because the game against Penta, I could actually see that being reasonably close on Dust 2. So there'll be a lot of rounds, and he'll be buying the AWP every time he can. So there'll be a lot of opportunities to get those kills. So I don't think that's a bad shout at all. Uh, okay, let's switch to NA. Let's stop our European bias. So the uh, NA standings, I'll get uh, my beloved producer to bring them up. But just to give you a rundown on how things stand at the moment, we had lots of question marks about Cloud9 off the back of Gfinity. They had a tough game against Keyed Stars when they came back straight away from Gfinity. It was the first game in the ESL, ESEA Pro League that they had to face. And Keyed Stars had only lost one game prior to playing that. Cloud9 did overcome them and have powered their way to the top of the table uh, with seven wins from eight matches played, 21 points. Interestingly enough, and I, I did find it surprising actually, Nihilum, who we've uh, talked about as being you know, a bad resting place for our uh, erstwhile colleague, Hiko, um, they're, nine, they're nine and seven on 21 points. Uh, then below them, we've got CLG, Liquid, who we did spend a fair amount of time being quite critical of and saying they need to really raise their game. And they've pushed now Keyed Stars out of the top four. Keyed Stars on eight plays, six wins, 18 points. Elevate below them on 18 points. So it's really congested there in that kind of from third uh, right down to fifth, sixth area. Luminosity just below them. And now we start getting into the more bargain basement area. You've got Affinity. A tempo Storm, Ace Method, and then Mouse Spaz right at the bottom with only one win from 10 games played. So that's the standings. Um, a little, Just some thoughts on those, really, Duncan. I mean, Cloud9, where they belong ultimately, right? Well, certainly where the expectation for where they should be is, yeah, that they should be the top team. With that said, as you kind of mentioned here, this kind of really sums up how that whole NA shuffle went. People made moves, and that whether a move seemed like a big deal or not that big a deal hasn't really had that much effect on who's actually the best. Like, there are no clear teams that, oh, we won the shuffle and you lost the shuffle. There's a, there's the three of there's four NA teams that are basically all around a similar level, depending on who plays who. Then you add in Keyed Stars as like a kind of wild card who have been doing very well recently. And now you've got five teams who, I mean, it feels like in three weeks, this top five could be mixed up again. And we could have a, Neilum could be fifth and suddenly Liquid could be second. And I mean, it feels like there's way, it, the parity is incredible at the top end of the NA scene right now. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. There really isn't a lot between everybody. And uh, just looking at, uh, again, just quickly uh, bringing up the, the numbers uh, just so we can have a look at who's been a standout performer. Uh, i got to say, I'm impressed with how Freakazoid's been betting into the team. Uh, based on the games that he had, he's getting 16 kills per match. You know, good numbers for an entry fragger. That's the average. And, of course, as we know, they've played a few games and they've played games against top opposition. An average of 26 points per game from him. Uh, looks to be settling in quite well. Did you ever have any doubts about him? Did you ever think he was going to be able to be the answer to one of the Cloud9 problems, which was, of course, entry fragging? I mean, in terms of just doing his role, just being an entry fragger, I thought it's if, if he, since they brought him in specifically and it was known that this is his role, it's not like we're just going to give him this role. I thought it was a good move in that sense. My bigger issue was if he had any issues, if he, if he couldn't carry the load in terms of contributing fragging, then it would fall even more so on guys like Shroud and nothing to contribute something to go along with the big acquisition of Skadoodle. So it's mm. more how it affects the rest of the team to me, because if he can just do his job, that's fine. But then it's going to be even more so on some of the others. So at the moment, I think it's it's going ex exceptionally well for how you could have accept it, expected. But I'm not sure if that won't level off a little bit in the, in the coming weeks. Well, that sort of points haul that he's bringing in per game actually puts him level with Shroud who has been probably their best player in terms of online, just pure fragging numbers. Quite interesting, actually. Skadoodle, not quite there yet, just in terms of uh, fra fragging ability. He's only bagging you 17 points per game, an average of 13 kills per game. So a little bit, you know, it's, it's a little bit of work to do before we. I think we see Skadoodle get back to his old and brilliant self. But 
I, I was really impressed with Freakazoid against Keith Stars. I actually uh, caught that game. I watched the VOD of it. And uh, I, I, I thought he was uh, his entry fragment was really on point. I think he's probably had more of an impact just in terms of what he's brought to Cloud9 than Skadoodle actually has. Which, yes, yeah, Skadoodle is definitely a step up from Shazam. We've talked about that quite uh, quite extensively. And we... I think you you were very you were ruthless in fact at G Finity when talking about Shazam. Uh, I'm sorry, but, I'm, uh, not, I'm not familiar with that player. Who is that? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Just, uh, uh, okay, uh, yeah. And, uh, but but um, I mean, I I still think Skadoodle will be the you know number one opera in NA. I, I I think he's just got that potential. It's just he spent so long out the game looking for a team in the aftermath of the I by Power thing. Obviously, it's going to take him a while to get back uh, to where he should be. Yeah, well, the thing is, when I've been watching Skadoodle, like, particularly when I watched the games at uh, Gfinity, it seemed like he would still get a crazy kill every now and then. He'd get like a huge kill that like helped open the roundup. The thing was, he wasn't actually his actual level in terms of like a, in terms of how you think of a star, which is a guy who puts up kills every round and then wins a round single handedly. He didn't have that many rounds that he won single handedly. He wouldn't like kill three people and win the round himself. He'd get the one really big initial kill, but then he might die and someone else might have to clean it up. So at the moment, it certainly makes sense why Shroud would be doing the best for them. It's probably the most versatile of the players overall. I think at the moment, that's the thing that Skadoodle still has to get into gear. Like he still has the crazy skill, but it, his overall form and his level isn't at, the, isn't at where it could be or where it was previously. Mm. So what's interesting actually is some of the results since we did our last show, uh, you know, we talked about obviously Cloud9, how they beat uh, Keyed Stars. Uh, they had a back-to-back -back with Elevate, uh, which was interesting. Uh, Cloud9 beat Elevate in overtime on Cobblestone, but then they lost the second game they played against them on Mirage 16-8. So Mirage... It seems to be a bit of a, a problem map for, for, for Cloud9 based on that. That's their one uh, defeat, I think, in the league. Uh, they obviously steamrolled it all over Method, 16-3. Uh, um, but this is what's interesting. So let's compare and contrast that to Nihilum. And Nihilum are obviously second place. Uh, and you'll see why I'm doing this in a moment. If you look at the uh, Nihilum games... Uh, they haven't played as many in the past week since we did the show. They had a 16-13 against Mouse Spaz, who were rock bottom uh, on cash, which you would have thought that should be you know plain sailing, especially with some of the players they've got on there. Um, you know, they had a 16-12 against Tempo Storm. They're 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 posting some really really close re close results against opposition. You would expect that they would blow away. But equally, by the same token, yeah, I think Cloud9, you know, they're not looking vintage, they're not looking polished, and they go head to head tonight. That's why I'm comparing the two teams. This is ultimately the battle for top spot. That's going to happen in, let me tell you when. So that's going to be, yep, that's going to be at 3 a, 4 a.m. Central European time. So. You know, I I, I got to say, how how do you see that going in that head to head? I mean, it's going to be on Inferno. Does, this does is a game. It? Just the narrative alone is delicious for this game because it's obviously Cephas and Hiko versus their old buddies from Cloud Nine. So yeah. that alone is going to be great. And then secondly, you add in the extra kind of narrative that famously cloud nine always secretly believed that inferno was their best map and that if they could just really show their strats they'd show the whole world and then they repeatedly had terrible land results on it so i'd i think it would it would just be extra sweet for the nihilum guys if they were able to beat cloud nine on this particular map because i don't know it's not necessarily a map that i still think of as like a stronghold for them i think they've still got some issues there so i think this should be a close should be a fun game i think so Looking uh, since we last did our show that this past week, obviously they played a total of four games. Nihilum, who would you say would have been the guy who like stood out and was really doing work for them, really posting big numbers as a fragger? If I had to guess, I'd maybe say Sanks. Not far off. Not far off. Uh, Got to be right. So this will blow your mind. Semphis. Okay. Now, I know you've been critical of your boy, Semphis, in the past, so that's why I'm saying it'll blow your mind. An average of 22 kills per game across a four-game sample size this week, posting 33 points average per game for anyone that drafted him. Uh, it's, pu it's pushed his salary right up. He's now 9,200. He's getting up into the terms of an elite salary maker, uh, doing work for Nihilum. Now, 
D- does that surprise you at all? I mean, on one hand, Senfis has always been good at playing against NA players. He really does kind of like know that world and how to play against those particular type of players and how to switch gears and play a scrimmy style. With that said, I think the problem here is that he's probably overperformed a few weeks. And so that's just in terms of the salary that's going to cost on fantasy. He's now probably actually priced you out of getting him because I, I don't know that he's reliable, that he's going to get these kills next week and the week after. So, I, I mean, in terms of this week, would I buy him? I'm not so sure I would. But I'm impressed that he's been able to, to, to do that well in a brand new team, a totally different environment, certainly. Mm. Uh, and of course, I mean, Hiko's been doing very well uh, as well. It's got to be said. He's uh, not that far behind, uh, posting an average of 22 points a game. Good pickup, but of course, he did have the higher salary to sort of begin with. If you drafted him in this week, he would have been quite costly. Semphis would have definitely have had more value uh, to it. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm really intrigued about how this game's going to go. I think if Cloud9 lose this game this is the game that if anything's going to put them on tilt and kind of throw them into a bad run of form get the fingers pointing get them a little bit kind of worried about whether or not they have made the right decisions it's going to be this game and like i know enough about what goes on in the pro scene the taunting the bullshit the social media lights up the constant burns the really aggressive reaction from fans people taking shit in the public domain on their stream, nobody wants to lose a grudge match in NA. It really is a, a huge psychological factor. So if Cloud9 were to lose, I, I, I don't know how they'd react to that. I mean, even, even though it, within the context of the season, it shouldn't really mean anything. I just think in the short term, I think they will have you know, real disappointment there. We all saw how upset they got at Gfinity where they felt they sold themselves short. So they're a team that are emotionally charged, if you like. Whereas Nihilum, as I'm being told I should say it, I, I prefer Nihilum, but yeah, apparently it's Nihilum. Whatever, it's a stupid name. Uh, I, I don't think they've got anything to lose going into this. It's just, a, it's just a pride match for them. I don't think anyone was expecting that team to beat Cloud9. I mean, on one hand, we did mention that since the run at, at the top is so close at the moment, mm. obviously you have to still keep a pace. You have to keep winning games. So it's not you can afford to lose there. But you're right. In terms of as the season goes, to, to an outsider, it shouldn't really matter who wins this game. As long as you both get make the LAN finals, you're both a favorite to win the LAN. That's all great. But when it's players who know each other this well, this is going to be one of those games in the season where it's like a, this one matters. Like the one who wins this gets not just bragging rights over the other team, but people will think that, oh, they're, they're better than them. And they're, they're the ones who are the favorites going into the next matchup. So I think it will be like a, a storyline game in terms of how the season goes. And so I think it's a big one for both, but particularly Cloud9, because if Cloud9 lose, I think it's more if Cloud9 lose that they're the ones who will get a bit a bit of shit thrown on them and people will be like, oh, you know, the ex Cloud9 players beat you. And uh, are you still going to be the best team? I think that that's when the, the big problem is there. Whereas like you kind of say, if Neilam lose to them, Okay, they can be like, hey, whatever, you know, we're a new team, we're still getting our things together. Whereas if they can beat Cloud9, they can kind of fuck with them a bit. Mm. So talking about storylines, we had a we had a good old time at Gfinity just really beasting on liquid, didn't we? And in particular Adrian, Badrin. We started that. We can feel rightly proud. Like if we contribute nothing else to Counter Strike, yeah. we, we we started Badrin. So that's it. We can retire happy, right? So Liquid actually haven't done too badly since we were talking about them and saying the sleeper must awaken. They they are the loss uh, to Nihilum, Nilum, whoever. Um, 16-4 on train. They also beat Keyed Stars, uh, who we were bigging up uh, by quite some uh, you know quite some distance, um, and they've managed to power themselves in a fourth spot. Uh, the Keyed Stars game, incidentally, was a 16-13 on Mirage. They had a much easier game against Ace, 16-6 there on Cash. Uh, so Liquid managed to turn that corner from a bit of a shaky start. Six wins from nine right now. Uh, what what do you think about them? I mean, I, I, can, I, do you think there's enough evidence there just in that sort of, you know, those few results this week to suggest that they're getting uh, to where they should be as a team? In NA, yeah. I would agree. The problem I see is I've never looked at their team and been like, oh, these are bad players and like there's nothing here to look at and, you know, like overhyped. 
The, re the reason they have issues is that the style of play that some of their players show, first of all, like as we mentioned with Adrian, he's just been kind of choking at the EU lands, but some of the other players have been decent, but then their playing style gets really punished by the good European teams. So in NA, I don't see it as being much of an issue. Like they're playing other teams that are going to have a similar style. It's a similar world within which like context for them to play within. And these have been some good players within that region, Alish. Adren, Fogley, these are these are good players within NA. So they should be able to compete and they should be able to get the old win over the Cloud Nines and Elamos of the world. So I don't see any problems there. It's just that I don't I don't think this is going to change much in terms of next time they go to a European LAN. And that, that issue still remains to be to be solved. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Uh I, I in, another interesting statistic, just going through these numbers that are coming out of me. Uh Team Liquid are on average uh that they they're posting the most points. So if you again, if you were to think about their five players, their lineup, their games, they're they're getting the most points on average per game. Uh, so nineteen, which is the best in any region, not just in NA. So this has been a very good week for them, statistically speaking. Uh, Adrian has kind of stepped it up. Uh, no doubt about that. He's been getting an average of 19 points, which is a huge step up from where he was in the previous week. So he seems to have turned the corner. 15 kills per game. You know, that's that signs of life right there, right? He's he's improved. Yeah, but that's also the thing. Adren against NA players has always been able to make himself a serviceable player, find his niche, be able to have an effect on the game. So, I mean, it makes sense. Hmm. Um, I mean, on top of that as well, I mean, you know, I, I let's just have a look at the results that are coming up. Because uh, I think, yeah, they have got a game coming up soon. Uh, when is it, though? And if I remember rightly, if memory serves me correctly. Uh, yeah, here we go. So, yeah, they've got a double header on Sunday against CLG, which, of course, are the other team in that top four. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about CLG first. Uh, as I said, CLG, they're third in the league. Six wins from eight. Looking, uh, you know, decent, serviceable. They've had a bit of a timeout. They haven't played a lot of games lately. Uh, in fact, I think the last game they played in the league was a 16-12 loss to Keed Stars. I think they've been off the grid since then. What do you think of this CLG team? I still think CLG is a decent team. I know they've gotten a lot of flack recently because people are highlighting the fact that like some of their players don't seem to have a very good understanding of what it takes to get better and how to improve and how to play tactically. Be all that as it may, a lot of those issues are shared by most of the NA teams, so I wouldn't put it all on CLG. A lot of them are newer players to the top team as well, and so I think they're a good team. The bigger problem, I think, for them is they need to get on and figure out who the fifth player is, because as far as I know, they still haven't officially signed a fifth player. So they keep playing using different people, and that's an issue in itself. I think they just need to decide, get on with it, and then figure out like the identity of the team, and then, then we can kind of put a storyline together. Whereas if they're going to be using different people... It's hard to make too much of a judgment call on the others. Mm. So talking about players uh, being signed, uh, got to say, we, we completely missed this when we were talking about Liquid. Flowsick, uh, that's Kyle Flowsick Mendez, has officially joined now. He's no longer a stand-in. I was uh, quite surprised by, by that. I mean, not that so much... The player he's replacing, I think he's a step up from that. But I didn't see a lot of Gfinity, for example, from Flosik to think, yeah, let's give this guy a contract. Or, or do you disagree with that? No, that's the thing. On one hand, if I take the first piece of context in that he's replacing Daps, okay, that's yeah. fine. On a skill level, yeah, okay, you can make that move. I don't mind. It's not, it's not a big deal. I don't think it's that much of an upgrade. Like, I don't think he's going to have a huge effect in that sense. So I think it's a bit of a wash there. The only issue for me is that Apparently, Daps and Adren, like in some sense, either shared the calling responsibility or Daps in some way contributed to it or was the in-game leader before and maybe had some kind of role. So maybe he was helping in that sense, which I don't know if he still is able to do within the organization. I don't know if that exists anymore. So that could be a minor concern. But otherwise, yeah, I kind of agree. It's just kind of a non-story almost because it's not. It's a bit of a wash in terms of it. Probably is a little bit better, but not enough to actually change the identity of the team, I don't think. Yeah, and he did say in that quote there, he said it felt really good to show a high level of potential with this lineup with a little practice we had at Gfinity. Everything was Silly boy, you're in liquid, not CLG, mate. Yeah, I know. It's yeah. liquid. <laughs> Everything was rushed at first, given our situation, but we are quickly moving into a much more structured dynamic within the roster in regards to strategies and theories. So maybe it is a case of, 
you know, they need to bet them in and they can actually deliver. I mean, Liquid, as you rightly say, you know, they're always doing well against North American teams anyway. Can they make that translate to uh, European teams? We'll have to wait and see. But uh, let's get back to the matter at hand, which is going to be on Sunday. Kind of the battle of third and fourth. CLG versus Team Liquid. They're going to play two maps back to back. I think this is going to be great. It's almost, you know, a series in itself. First map's going to be Inferno. Second map's going to be Train. How do you see this one going? Now, Train's obviously the big world because I really do not know what to make of these two teams on that map. Mm. I mean, I would have to say Inferno was the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's correct, yeah. Inferno, I think for Inferno, I would actually edge that towards Liquid. I think that's a map they can be good on. They can, that can be a favorite area for them. So I'd say they'll get that one. For the train one, I really have a hard time picking that one because I think the teams, these two teams should be fairly evenly matched. So I can really see that going either way. Mm. <sighs> okay, I'll give CLG right. the train game. Yeah? So tell me why. Just, I think it really is going to be a 50-50 there. And so... I think CLG, bizarrely, actually might be tactically better of the two teams. I think their team's pretty decent. It's not that they have a great tactical style. I think they just have a style that works for their personnel. Like, they actually kind of know their limits to a degree. So I, I think on the map like Train at the moment, with so much undiscovered stuff and so many new things being figured out all the time, I think the teams, in theory, that are better tactically should have the initial edge on that map. Uh, yeah, well, possibly right. I mean, what about Inferno? Because Liquid... Uh, I'm trying to think if I remember right. G G Finity, they got smashed by Nip. That was like the sixteen one, sixteen two we watched right at the start of the tournament, wasn't it? I uh, think it was one. Yeah, so I'm pretty pretty sure that was on Inferno. They lost to Vox on Inferno. Uh, and in this league, looking at the results here on the screen, they lost to Affinity. 16-13 on Inferno. So Team Team Liquid and Inferno, it's not a, a marriage made in heaven, uh, if, if I can remember quite rightly. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's got to play to CLG's favor a little bit as well, right? I mean, you're certainly right in terms of the recent results. They've had some bad ones there. But, mm. I mean, historically, I have always thought it was one of their best maps. So I'm not entirely... I'm not going to jump too far the other way on that at the moment. I still think they can be good on this map. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, um, I, you know, if, you, if you're a betting man, obviously take on board the thoughts of Duncan. Sometimes the numbers can lie. As Scott Steiner once famously said, they can spell disaster for you. So don't, don't just follow stats. There's a bit more to it than that. It's not an exact science. Uh, let's look at some of the other games that are going to be coming your way tonight for all the night owls out there or for our NA brethren. Uh, we've obviously talked about about the big game of the night, which is going to be Cloud9 against Nihilum on Inferno. I think that's going to be a barnstormer. Bragging rights up for grabs. That's I'll, I'll probably stay up and watch that, actually. I think that's going to be uh, one of the games uh, of the season. It's going to be a, a talking point uh, for a week, especially with all of that storyline that's going on there. A uh, bit less interesting, Mouse Spaz versus Tempo Storm. So we've got the... Bottom team going up against the fourth from bottom team. Uh, I mean, Tempo Storm, obviously a Hearthstone organization. They did sort of come in to uh, CSGO with a fanfare. Haven't really made a big splash yet, but they should be able to beat Mouse Spaz, I think. You'd uh, think so, Inferno because well. it looks like Mouse Spaz are by far the whipping boys of the whole league. And unfortunately, the only when you think of Mouse Spaz, you actually think of the team that now became Liquid, at uh, CLG rather. They were the, That was where their home was previously. So not really any reason right now to think that even Tempo Storm would slip up against them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's quite interesting, really, because for, uh, for a team that are doing so badly uh, and are right down the bottom, their players... This just shows you how sometimes counterintuitive fantasy betting can be. So there isn't one player on the Mouse Spaz team, despite the fact they've only won one game, who is below 20 points average. <laughs> this week, I should say. So even though they're getting battered, uh, because they're posting like 12, 13 rounds per game this week, they've had some sort of you know close drawn out games. There's a, there's a imp T on Mouse Spaz Right, 29 kills average per game this week. Only cost you 5,600. 
Yeah, insane. I mean, if you're looking, if you're looking for someone to round out uh, your overall team, and you, you want someone cheap, that that might not be the worst shout if he's able to get that in losses. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's crazy. This is what I mean. Sometimes with the fantasy betting, you got to look at the bigger picture and uh, you know to take a punt on some of the lesser players because, of course, as we've said, it's not just about kills. It's not just about wins although more so than League of Legends, which I know in your show last night, you were like, no, no, but the thing is, Monty, the thing is, it can be very hard to sort of think about how fantasy works compared to the actual uh, you know, business of winning and winning games. But um, with this, you want to think about you know, not just frags and defuses, you want a lot of rounds, you want the games to be drawn out uh, as possible. So even a team that competitively loses, they can be better than a team that blasts a 16-0 every week. So, you know, losing 16-14 every week, that losing side is going to probably post more points than a 16-0 victor. That's kind of the things you need to think about here. Uh, so back to the fixtures. Uh, we've got Cloud9 taking on Affinity as well. That happens before the uh, bragging rights match. Um, so, I mean, that should be an easy win for Cloud9. It is on overpass, though. Any Any potential banana skins there, Duncan? Not really. I mean, that isn't a map that is a Cloud9 map, not not in any sense at all. It's also one of the maps that they used to famously complain about and always steer clear of and, and veto when they could. With that said, I'm not expecting Affinity is going to be really great and it's going to be some super wildcard joker pick for them. And then you add in the fact that Cloud9 just has much better players. This should be a Cloud9, a, a secure win. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And then finally, the last fixture uh, tomorrow will be Luminosity versus Nihilum. So Nihilum are doing a double header back to back. They're going to take on Cloud9 on Inferno first. Then they go into a game against Luminosity on Overpass. So this is this is again really interesting because imagine if you come off the back of I don't know, let's say for example a close defeat against Cloud9 and you're having to deal with, you know, processing that mentally. And then you're going into a game against Luminosity who will bang bang in the middle, uh you know, capable of winning, five wins from nine games played, 15 points, just below Elevate, but, but above Affinity. Um, you know, that's got the potential to to be the start of a slide, surely. And on a map again, like Overpass, which, uh, you know, it's there, but I don't think a lot of people particularly enjoy playing it in its current form. So this is actually, Luminosity plays kind of on Overpass? Sorry, in, in Nihilum they play on Overpass. Nihilum, okay. Yeah. I mean, you have to realize since the one of the things that they have going for them is that they have Illuminosity is the team that has uh, Peter, the former Liquid player, I believe. That's correct, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Then, yeah. then this is a map where if you're a good AWP, you can have an impact on this map, certainly. There, mm. There's some very good spots to cover. <sighs> Will they actually be able to beat Neelum? I would still I would still favor Neelum myself. I would say they'll win. I think the quality overall in the team should be better, but I think this is one where I, I think it could be a close game, especially with the way overpass goes. You could you could see big CT halves, I think. Yeah, and I've got, I've got to say, just while we're talking about numbers, if you haven't been looking at Luminosity during your fantasy drafting, uh, Peter, which Thorin just brought up there, he's going to get you he, this week 32 points per game that you included him in. Salary of 7,900. Uh, the foreign imports, the Swedish import, Pythe, 32 points from him as, as well. And, of course, the old man, Anger, uh, who's been around for uh, you know donkeys, uh, he's not doing too bad either with 28 points per game. So, I mean, this is a side that does have people who can get you some points in there. They're definitely competitive. I think it's going to be an interesting game. And as I said, if Nihilum do lose to Cloud9, they're going in with a head of bad, uh, bad juju. Um, you know, Luminosity could be the side to sort of capitalize on that. Well, I mean, I mentioned before when we were talking about Chris J, like you have to look for the people who actually have a history of being really good online because they're probably going to be a bit of a steal in terms of their numbers initially. Anger's a great example of that. He's always been dynamite online. The guy is not same. He was always really good in that sense. He even used to be pretty good at the ESEAs. It's more just he was the international guy who never never could make that breakthrough. So I wouldn't be surprised if he can pick you up some good points because his team's good enough to get a lot of rounds on, te on better teams. And then maybe within that, he can give you some good points there in terms of what his salary is. I mean, what what is his actual salary? Can you look it up? Uh, yeah. So hang on. So whose salary? Let me just check it. Who Anger? Else did you want? Anger is 8,100 currently. That's actually reasonably high, I guess. So that's probably about what it should be. I think that makes sense then. I mean, and we talked about NAF Fly or NAF Fly uh, last week. We highlighted him. He was the guy who was doing all the damage for Luminosity. That made his salary jump up to one of the highest in the region, 11,300. 
And he's bagging. That's, that's too high at this point, though. Yeah, yeah, of course it is. Uh, but that's what happens. He was barnstorming. I think he had over 40 points average per game last week. So that's what happens. The, the salaries are reactive. If you don't get them in your team uh, at the right time, you, you get wrecked, basically. But yeah, so I, I think that's uh, interesting potential. But yeah, anger's, anger's up there. It's, it's high. It's certainly, as we pointed out, you know, the mouse spaz guys could have had them for a you know, cut price. Uh, but let's just have some final thoughts just about the NA, NA region. Looking at that top four, is that what you'd expect to see come the end of the season? Or do you think Keed Stars, Luminosity, Elevate, one of those teams can maybe replace some of the others? I mean, ha has the status quo been established is what I'm asking. I mean, the actual order at the moment is quite reasonable, I think. Like when I look at overall... I think it's actually right that, that, that it's basically a top four Keith stars and then elevate Illuminosity are on the outside looking in and they're really needing like some sick run of form if they want to get into the top four. If it's to, if it's me, I'm thinking that they're at the end of the season, assuming CLG lock in like JDM, if he really is going to become the real fifth, not just a stand in, I think they can battle Neelam to, for second. I think Cloud9 should be first, Neelam or CLG second. And then the fourth spot is the interesting one because I do think Keith Stars could take that fourth spot. But I also, I wouldn't begrudge it. I think Liquid could do it as well. So I think it might be Keith Stars who end up fourth. But I think overall at the moment, the, the actual, it, although they haven't played the same number of games, it is sort of how I would rank it at the moment. I think that's about right for where okay. people are initially from the first moves, you know. So there we are, guys. So if you want to get involved and you do want to do some drafting so you can get your head around uh, what we're talking about on this show, it is by the numbers after all. We, we do like to have our little statistical uh, offshoots. Uh, so you can you get to it yourself to alphadraft.com, register an account, and you, you'll be able to see straight away. I, I did it myself very recently. Uh, you'll be able to see what sort of competitions you can enter. Um, and you can just join in there, pick a side. It tells you how much prize money's up for grabs. I think there's some now where it's like, you know, you pay $5 to rent it, you've got a chance to win a $1,000 prize. Uh, but there's all different levels. It, it, it's actually quite a cool system, very simple to use. You'll pick it up in no time at all. If an old guy like me can do it, you guys definitely can. Now, just to end on something, because we don't want to leave you. I mean, we know what it's like when we're looking at numbers and we're talking statistics and we're talking results and we're talking predictions. You know, it's like being in school for some of you, I imagine. And that's, that's the last thing you want. So I want to end talking about uh, a team that uh, I, I think are, are turning heads, but at the moment for all the wrong reasons, Team Kingwin. Um, they were, you know, thrown together, Thorin, as a collection of stars, almost like misfits, if you want, you know, people who've been in other teams and for whatever reason it hadn't worked, you know, think Scream, who's been sort of pushed out uh, of the, uh, you know, uh, pushed out of the French scene. Obviously, he's Belgian, French-speaking Belgian. Uh, and obviously, Makalela, of course, who, when he was in NIP, they even won. Uh, okay, it was a minor tournament, but they still won a tournament, and then he gets pushed out. They bought Rain uh, out of a contract, I believe. And now, you know, they, they, they kind of put all this money. They outbid SK, but their results have been pretty poor. So uh, what yeah. have you made of uh, this Kingwin team? The thing with Kingwin is I don't begrudge these guys getting a chance in the team, etc. Because if you if you look purely at the context, there wasn't really any teams available for Kingwin to pick up. Like all a lot, most of the teams, new orgs have come in and picked them all up for top money. Our old orgs have managed to retain the talent and sign them big contracts. So there wasn't many players out there. So if you want pure exposure, it's actually a good pickup. You've got a bunch of players that fans are excited in. People are hyped to see the matches. If they can win even one or two games, people are going to be, there's going to be some hype around them. I can't see that this actually will end up beyond marketing purposes being a worthwhile investment though. When you hear some of the salary, like when you, the, those reports about how much rain apparently cost, that just seems above and beyond what it could be worth for him in terms of what he's actually going to bring to the team and then what success the team can have. I can't see them, like I can't see this being a team who could break into the top eight in Europe. I don't think it will happen. Yeah, I, I don't either. And of course, historically, of course, teams with, you know, just from m different nationalities, when you've got that sort of blend of nationality, I really struggle to think of a team with that kind of blend of nationalities where everyone's speaking a different native language. I can't think of one off the top of my head in any iteration of Counter-Strike that was truly successful. I mean, the only one I can think of is the one-off mix team where it was Kenny S. Apex, Taz Neo, yeah. and then Overdrive. And, and you have to realize they only went to one LAN with that lineup. Yeah. And then the teams they beat were, okay, Navi was good. But then beyond that, like the second best team was like uh, the UK team with Rattlesticks. It's not like they went and, and beasted the elite competition, nah, you nah. know. 
So even that was, and that was a big one-off as well. And you're talking about, you're still talking about some of the best players in the game at that tournament, like Kenny S. Taz was very good at the time. Even Apex at the time had had some good results. Well, I think this is a very different scenario where some of these players haven't been in a top team for like four or five months at this point in time. They all they all had to be good to carry overdrive in his magical exactly. checkbook ultimately. So uh, I totally forgot about that, man. I I, I might do that. So I, I'll, maybe I'll take this alpha draft money yeah. and I'll go out and I'll get like, you know, I'll get all the boys in. I'll just get Fnatic. I'll be like, look, Olaf Meister's ears fucked. Just get me in there for a week. We'll go to a LAN and, and then I can turn around and then next time I'm on an analysis desk, Nobody can say I don't know what I'm talking about. Because, hey, I, I played for Fnatic, right? So, obviously, I do. I'm a player now. So, uh, you've done it again, Duncan. You're a fucking genius. That's Never let it be said it all around, Rich. Yeah, yeah that, that's going to be the, the rise of popularity. Uh, so, just to get back to, to Kingwin for just a moment, and then we'll close the show off. You're even saying you can't see them breaking into the top eight teams in the world. In that case, realistically, how, how long are Team Kingwin going to give it? I mean, I imagine... That sure, the exposure's great. I mean, they've picked a lot of fan favorites from the region. Everyone still raves about Scream. Makalela has a lot of fans. In fact, when we were at uh, Finland, when we were at the Asus Republic of Gamers in Winter Invitational, I'd probably say more so than Forest, more so than Get Right, it was Makalela that was being asked for the signature more. Obviously, he's a bit of a novelty. Perhaps some of the returning fans had got the others before, but he was getting mobbed. Like he was deemed a really you know popular player. He got a stand innovation at the end. You know, MVP in the finals. So he's obviously got a lot of fans out there. Fox, anyone who's been on HLTV forums down the years knows that whenever it was like, who is the best CS player of all time, Forrest or Neo? It would just get inundated with Portuguese people saying, Fox, Fox, what, what do you mean? It's Fox. It's a Fox, best author, best player, best everything. So he's got a lot of fans, no doubt about it. Uh, but surely there comes a point where you've got to actually have results as well as just that sort of fan base, that exposure. Are Team Kingwin going to be in this for the long haul with a team that you're saying can't break into the top eight? I, whether they're going to be with this team, I don't think they are, actually. Like, I don't know what the issue with, is with the contract, like whether they've signed them to a full year or how, how long they have to keep those players, in theory, and pay them. That might be an issue. But it sounds like Kingwin's people who've got a lot of money to spend. If, to me, this is just a stepping stone where Kingwin wanted, like, okay, we want to be in the game first. Let's get a team. And then in the future, if Kingwin still wants to invest a lot of money, which it sounds like they have, and they want to be around, then for them, if I were them, I'd just be positioning yourself. So now everyone knows you've got money. Everyone's heard these stories. In, in a sense, it's great PR if you want to recruit people in the future. Like, you know, there's shit tons of money out there. What you're really doing is you're waiting in position to the moment where one of the other teams, their contract finishes, and now maybe you can grab like a top five, six team who you can offer oodles of money and a blank check and maybe then they're the new king when you know. I can't see this actual like dream team of hyped players being the one that, that gets you to where you should be in terms of how much you're putting in. I think I think the cost won't weigh up in terms of what you get back for it. And and just final question, what if it is a complete disaster? What if they can't even qualify for a major or uh, they, they, they don't get into any tournaments like or if they do they get into a few and it ends quite badly for them what happens in terms of the individual clout of each player because let's not forget these are already misfit picks you know fox has been out of the scene for a while makalela you know there's lots of rumors going around about that he was difficult to play with in nip that it was a you know in-game attitude issue scream you know it doesn't seem to be getting a lot of options uh, into you know, Titan would rather try and resurrect RPK from the dead uh, than have Scream back in there. Although I think if that didn't work, maybe there'd be a road back for him. But if this team fails badly, what does it do long term to the career of these individual players? I mean, I think some of them, that's why it's great for some of them. Like they've somehow stumbled into a scenario where they're getting paid a lot of money, apparently, for a team where at the moment they haven't even had to show anything. So that's great for them right in the short term. For people like Scream and Makaleli, I don't know what the real options are. Like, I don't know. I kind of feel like if they don't make it in this team, we're just probably never going to see them in a top five or six team ever again. I just don't, I don't, I don't see which team's going to take the chance or who's going to bring them in now. If anything, those teams will take in different new players and gamble on someone new, you know. So the player that I think actually still like won't be crushed by this ending is probably Rain because the games I have seen him play, I always thought he seemed like a good player. He seemed like he had pretty good upside. 
And so if he can one day find a spot, his, his problem is that he's Norwegian. If he keeps trying to play with Norwegian teams, yeah, he's probably never going to be on top team. If he can one day, maybe, hey, if teams like Nippo taking in players now, maybe there's the chance there for someone like him to still make it out. But for a lot of the others, like Fox J, I mean, he's obviously never going to play for like Envious or someone. So I think for some of them, it just makes sense. It's like the right place in their career. Some of them, yeah, it probably will be the end of the road if it doesn't work out and they will carry that baggage to the, with them to some degree. Mm. I think I think someone like Rain can survive it. I think Scream to a degree in as much as he'll always be a fan favorite and he'll always people will always want to see him have crazy online stream games. But I, I think it this probably will be the last chance for some of these guys, the last chance saloon type scenario. Mm. Okay, well, look, Duncan, thanks a lot for all your thoughts on that. Uh, always a pleasure uh, talking Counter-Strike with you. Thanks to Sam our producer, for uh, pushing all the buttons behind the scenes as best as he can with his fat fingers. Uh, of course, thanks to all the people who tuned in. Thanks to Alpha Draft for the big piles of uh, money. And, of course, uh, a <laughs> and of course, uh, an awesome product. You guys should absolutely check it out. So that's why we're here at the end of the day. So thanks a lot for watching the show. Uh, this was By The Numbers. Take care, and may all your drafts be Alpha. See you next week.